they you just have to wear masks i believe in that because even they say oh yeah you can catch it if you're wearing a mask but if everyone's wearing a mask no one can spread it so you just have to wear a mask and just limit the amount of people per car per entrant per driver per whatever and athletes i'm sure swimming if they just limit 10 people at a pool at a for an hour and you just limit contact and that's fine everything should be able to go ahead. Are we open? Have we got people in? Yeah, it's open. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of people in. So yeah, we're just going to wait for a few more, but I think we can carry on. <laughs> more people die from the every year that's ridiculous anyway i think should we, should we kick off yeah i'm getting kick off yeah, good evening ready. everybody and uh, uh welcome to uh, the very first webinar of know your sport uh, my name is Adam Brook. Um, I have a background in sports marketing and sponsorship. Uh, before we kick off, I would like to welcome the uh, Pepper family. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we've got Dad, Ian, Mom, Cheryl, um, daughter, Tasman, and uh, youngster, Jordan. Guys, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you. Thanks for yeah, having thanks us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, guys, you are certainly a family of uh, motorsport. Um, it's sort of steeped in tradition in starting with you um but you didn't start on the four wheels you started on two um until you broke your back tell us about how you got actually you actually got into uh, motorsport to start off with uh my father emigrated out from england when he was 15 years old my granddad raced in england and when they came to south africa my dad started racing and um, became very good friends with the Riddell family um so and then my dad and did um what do they call it uh, grass track and they started him and neville riddell and another guy dave berry started the first ever brick or grass track circuit in 1967. so that's where i grew up at the dirt and everything was at that stage of my life i was like three years old four years old and um that's where it all started and then from there just followed my dad and him around at all the racing and Kyle Army and circuit racing and all that sort of stuff until I started racing motocross in the mid 70s until the mid 80s 86 I think I stopped when I broke my back and went circuit racing and from there Formula V's, Formula GTR's, Formula 2000, Polo Cup, a bit of karting and that's when the kids started and I sort of stopped racing to concentrate on the kids in 2009. Um, and, you know, I mean, you had a, a pretty successful career. You had 10 years in the, the VW Polo Series. Um, in every single year of those 10, you finished in the top five. I mean, that's a pretty... Yeah, you know, I know. Very, look, my, my history, I didn't win too many major championships. I think two. A uh, couple in motocross in regional and like uh, certain series that were run. But I was the best bridesmaid in thing in the country. I think I got 11 or 13 second place national championship awards. So, yeah, I've, I've like supported the guys from the back end. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously, you met you met Cheryl during this time. Cheryl, you, you become a uh, a motorsport widow, or are you very much involved with the family in in the sport as well? Um. I never actually, I used to actually go and watch motocross when I was younger as well. Um, and then um, I've always enjoyed motor racing, but I really got involved when I met Ian and I used to go with him, I had to all the races and everything. And then when the kids were born, I think I'm at the racetrack quite a bit. So I think in the last few years, I haven't had been, I don't go to all the like, like local races, but I try and get to all the international races that I can go to. So. Yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty involved with it. She likes traveling. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> she, I do she doesn't like the local races. She likes the Italy <laughs> and the France and the <laughs> all those nice places she gets to visit. <laughs> uh, the, the holiday element of it. And yeah. um, Tasman, uh, you obviously got into it as well. When did you sort of um, 
figure out that you also had a love for uh, motorsport like your dad? Well, my dad, I was involved. I was at the racetrack from two weeks old, apparently. So it's pretty much where I was born and raised. Um, I started the year I turned five. So I was still four when my dad got my first go-kart. Um, yeah, I think I just spent every, every weekend at the racetrack with my dad. And that's where the love for, for, the, for motorsport began. And um, since then, I don't think we've missed many weekends away from the racetrack, except for now during this time. And obviously, there's not too many girls um, in the sort of professional racing circuit. You, though, very much stand out. I mean, from your results, it, you take on the guys just as much as, as the guys take on the guys themselves, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a question that's asked, and how hard is it to be a female in, in motorsports? Um, but from a young age, I only ever knew racing. I only ever raced against guys. So it was kind of all I knew, and it's kind of how we, I had to learn. Um, so to me, guys were just another competitor, just as much as girls were other competitors when I did start racing against them on the international level. And um, so to me, it wasn't, it wasn't a guy or a girl thing. It was, these were my competitors and these are the guys I have to race against. So I either got to get fast and beat them or I got to sit in the pits and, and watch them. So <laughs> that was kind of how it went down. And that's how I became the driver that I am. And you certainly want to be reckoned with. Jordan, you also started racing at the age of four in go-karts. Um, and then you started racing cars at the age of 15 before you could even get uh, your, your road license. Um, tell us a, a bit about how you got into the, the sport. And did you also just automatically fall in love with it uh, after being t taken to the track from also two weeks old, I presume? Yeah, exactly. I think, I think the only thing missing... Um, from like my story and Tazan's story compared to we have, we have a middle daughter uh, or middle sister, sorry, no, my parents have a middle daughter, um, is I think me and Taz were taken to the track from a young age and my other sister wasn't quite taken to the track from early age. And I'm sure something happens with fuel, the way it mixes into your lungs and blood and stuff. And you just, you, you don't want to let it go. So I think same with, with Taz, probably begged my dad long enough to get me a cart. And the nice thing with my parents is, it was never forced upon me that I was going to become a professional racing driver. And it wasn't like my dad wanted to live a dream through either of us. It was on our choice, really, whether we wanted to. We said, Dad, can we go testing this weekend? He would take us testing. If we said, Dad, do you want to come watch our football game on the weekend? He would do that or mom or whatever. So I was able to do multi-sports. And obviously, sports is my passion. Um, and motorsport was one of those things that just was my, my first love and what I really wanted to do. And growing up in a motorsport orientated family, it was quite clear what I wanted to do. And I'm lucky enough that I'm the younger sibling. I think Taz learned things the hard way, competing overseas in, in formula racing, chasing the F1 dream. And from South Africa, it's kind of impossible. Uh, it is impossible right now. There's no real government fundings like other countries support their drivers and it just doesn't make it viable. So we chose a different route for me. We went touring car racing. I missed out on that formula element that everyone thinks you should have. And we went then, yeah, basically managed to, to make a good career so far in GT racing. And yeah, living in Europe now since I was 18 years old. Obviously, like you mentioned, I switched to cars at a young age, but that's what you had to do. As soon as I could get my license, they actually held it back for a year which was a bit of a shame. Uh, Motorsports Africa put a, a birth date rule in and I missed it by 30 days. So if I, if I was 30 days older, I would have been been probably one year ahead in my development. But in the end, it, was, it worked out the way it worked out. And yeah, super grateful, like I said, to have a family. I think in the early days to have the love for the sport is the, the most crucial bit. You know, we didn't, we didn't, we spent enough time and effort and my parents are fortunate enough to spend enough money to do it professionally but not to the point where i hated motorsport like I, you know you, a lot of people that i raced against i think were super talented and stuff and but i think they just tired out a bit because they were just doing it so much and you see it with most sports you know if you're doing it flat out which is not a bad thing but if you know you just you start to lose your love for it and i think i i picked it up seriously at the right time to sacrifice other things and make the career instead of picking it up, 
you know, at age eight, if all you're doing is going to the track Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm sure by the time you're 16, when it's actually time to take it seriously, that you, all you want to do is just go party with your mates. And I kind of had it the other way around. And um, Ian, obviously you've been involved in motorsport for significantly longer than the kids. Do you still have that passion for, for motorsport that you had when you started um, all those years ago? Yeah, I still have a big passion for motorsport. i um, involved quite heavily with Motorsport South Africa and different commissions and stuff. And the last four and a half years, I got back involved in the motocross side of things to head up a commission and try and help them restructure motorsport which seemed to go off quite well and it, it did build handed over now to somebody else and a bunch of the commission members now that are really passionate and taking it forward and for some reason I managed to get myself involved or volunteer again to help the, the cross-country motorcycle guys try and get something going because it's been left behind for the past three four years nobody's looked at it and I love riding my, motor, my off-road bikes um, I love going watching the kids racing. I did go back a couple of years ago to race saloon cars again in that VW Challenge. I went back for the year with Lee Thompson preparing our car. Um, it was a car that we built for Tasman and she raced successfully the year before. I went and it was lying around the beginning of the year and Lee said, come, let's go and try and win a championship. So we went back. We did win the championship quite convincingly, but it wasn't something that really I wanted to get back into a race car. I much prefer driving my, uh, riding my off-road bikes and competing in the cross-country championship and off-road bike racing. And uh, Tasman, uh, Jordan mentioned your, um, your dream of Formula One. Is that still a, a dream or have you put that to bed and, and you're now concentrating on, on where you are? Well, I just turned 30, so I don't think <laughs> that dream is reachable right now. So, um, yeah, like I made it into W Series last year and it kind of gave me that opportunity to race internationally again, which I'm really fortunate for. And yeah, just, just enjoying the experience and trying to gain as much exposure and experience and everything that I can from it and learn as much as I can. And if I can get into GT racing, I mean, that would be the ultimate goal. Well, the ultimate goal would be to pay to it get paid to race. <laughs> so basically, yeah, I like what my brother's doing. Um, but like Jordan said, we kind of, we went the Formula route initially from karting. I went straight into Formula Fords when I was 15 years old. And um, it was just the wrong route to take in order to try and make a career out of motorsports, especially from South Africa. So now that I'm there overseas again, it's a, there's an opportunity to create different different routes and different doors so I've got to just do as well as I can over there and hopefully be able to pick up a spot to to race in GT championships or um, I don't think Formula One is gonna happen <laughs> I mean you can't you can't ever put it away but at this point in time I mean the guys that are involved in Formula One and where they've come from and what age they've started at 30 isn't the right uh, the right age to step into something like that so to do GT racing would be the ultimate goal, but we got to wait and see. And, you know, hopefully next year I have another opportunity and yeah, we take it from there. Look, on that, with the Formula One thing, um, Tasman was due to drive at that Formula One festival that was coming to South Africa as lockdown happened. I think Bottas was driving the Merck. Um, uh, cool. David Coulthard was driving the Red Bull. And the Renault factory in England contacted Tasman to drive there, do the demo hot laps at Kailami in their Formula One car. So somebody must have seen and done something. Obviously, she's from here, so it costs less money to bring somebody out. But yeah, that was like a big feather in her cap and everything we put into it. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I and mean, Tasman, you had a very good uh, 2019 season, seeing it was your first in the W Series. Uh, I think you finished 10th, um, uh, am I correct? Yeah, I could have finished a little bit higher. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I struggled actually well, initially getting into it um, to make it into W Series. I mean, I made it through by the skin of my teeth a little bit. Um, stepping from the Polar Cup front wheel drive into a Formula car. And I hadn't been in a Formula car for over six years. So it was quite a difference and quite a speed change and 
a lot of adjustments and stuff. So, I mean, every race got better and better. Um, I had my brother there shouting at me on the sidelines. <laughs> uh, he was my, my side engineer. And um, yeah, I mean, I learned so much and every race got so much better. Um, the last two races, I mean, I made a mistake at one of my best qualifying rounds and I ended up scoring zero points, which knocked me down a few places in the championship. And then the last round was a little bit of a, a daunting round where we had mixed conditions the entire race weekend. So there wasn't much time to get used to the track and people who had raced on the track for all the UK girls had obviously raced there for majority of their life. So they knew the track really well. And yeah, I mean, going back there, this, well, it was going to be this year. It was kind of, you know, go all out and, you know, hope for the best kind of thing, but give it everything where last year I sort of took it a little bit more cautious as I wanted to try and progress into the next year and then obviously work on those positions that I had already got. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was a fun year. It was a lot was gained from it and um, I learned a lot and yeah, hopefully we get to do that again. And uh, Jordan, did you um, t look up to uh, Tasman when you were obviously seven years younger? Um, or has there been a bit of rivalry between you guys um, throughout your careers in terms of who's getting where and who's doing what? Um, I don't think there's ever been rivalry within our family, which is pretty awesome. You know, we've always only been supportive of each other, which is which is really good. Uh, but yeah, I definitely looked up to Taz, and especially in karting, she was probably one of the quickest senior drivers, or well, she was always a category above, you know, and she was always kicking the dude's asses and like um, pretty much taking it to them week in, week out. And yeah, she, she obviously got her South African national colors when she was just 17 years old. So she was had a Springbok blazer, first female for a long time since Deirdre Wilson to have one and the only female since, as far as I'm aware. So I think in that sense, and just in terms of calibers and achievements within motorsport, she was ticking them off one, one at a time within South Africa. And that, that was cool and nice to see. And I had that support and that knowledge, you know. What's cool is, is when you watch your older sibling do something and it's not always going to go right. When it goes wrong, you can learn what to do. So it kind of made my development steps a lot easier because you'd be stupid to fall into the same mistakes twice, especially with the family. Like my, with my dad with so much experience, my sister guiding me along, my mom, my other sister supporting. If we fell into the same trap over and over again, I would just say that it's just our own stupidity, you know? So it was really fortunate to have her there. And like she said, yeah, she missed out on her, maybe her career shot at Formula One, but there's no reason why I've paved my way into GD3, making a name for myself. And everyone links us two together as kind of a sibling powerhouse now in Europe, knowing what she's achieving in W Series. And I think that opportunity could lead to us finally battling it out on track together. I think we've only ever done two races together in our lives before. So maybe in the future, Taz comes to play in my world a bit. And yeah, we'll be good. That would be uh, uh, brilliant, um, having you both together on the same track. Um, so essentially, guys, you've all got a, a huge background in motorsport. Um, and essentially, the reason for this webinar was to give um, up-and-coming athletes some insight into what it takes to become a professional motorsport uh, driver. And starting with you, um, from a physical perspective, what are the, what are the requirements on a, a, a youngster growing up Obviously, most of them, I imagine, start in carts and, and then progress from there. Chat to us a bit about the actual physical requirements of, of what it takes to become a, a motor racer. And then, uh, Mom Cheryl, maybe you can chat to us a bit from the mental side, because I'm sure you are there emotionally and mentally for the kids. And maybe you can give us some insight into the mental side of, of what it takes to become a, a professional uh, motor racer. Maybe our dietary requirements. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, look, from youngsters at four years old, I mean, that's where they're getting involved in motocross, um, karting, and that's where they're starting their motorsport careers. It's those two paths, motorcycles or karting. And um, generally, the kids are pretty fit and natural fitness at that age. Um, the more time they spend on the equipment, the better off they are because they get used to, you can't get better training than driving a kart or riding a motorbike. 
you can't simulate, especially the youngsters. They just naturally got stamina and strength and fitness and whatever that they do. But as they get older, they've got to start working on it. And um, the dedication and commitment that I watched from both Tasman and Jordan and the guys that we've been lucky enough to be involved with along the way, um, they've got to put a lot of effort and time into keeping themselves fit. They don't have to look like uh, some sort of bodybuilder or whatever, but they've got to be mentally fit and they've got to be physically fit to, to stay in the game and concentrate enough. And then obviously you can't substitute bums in the seats or bums on the seats for extra fitness the right way and honing your skills. Just another what thing, on, I've watched Jordan and Tasman. They train every single day. It's, um, it's not just I'm getting up and I'm going to go and, and ride in my car today. This is full-on training, they need to get strength, upper body strength, arm strength, um, they need to be super fit, especially Jordan with his like um, endurance racing, I um, mean, you can be in the car for hours at a time, if you're not fit, there's, it's impossible that you're going to be able to, to actually drive your car at that speed for that, for that length of time, for each, for, like for each stint, so they probably be able to tell you a bit more exactly what they actually do to like to keep that fitness up. It's not, and it's not today. I don't feel like training, you know, it's every day. I don't feel like training, but I need to train. So, and even during lockdown, it's training every day. At Tasman. The, sorry, Karen. Yeah. No, it's fine. When they were growing up, Cheryl, were they as dedicated as they are now? Or were there times where, where you and Ian had to say, guys, get out of bed now, you need to go and train and, and get your bum in the car? No. Or was it always very much up to them? No, it was up to them. There's a few times Tasman used to say to her dad, let's go to the track. And she used to get to the track and then say, no, I'm going to ride my bicycle today. And then also ride her bicycle and then we'd come home. He didn't even have to unpack the, the cart out the <laughs> thing. And he should ride her bicycle and come home. And that was like, like a day at the track. So... But nobody said, well, now at the track, you better go and, and do it. Um, I must admit, when they were growing up, they never used to to actually hey, go out very much. Because, and uh, I don't think, hey, Jordan seemed to think that I, that we said that they couldn't go out, which was not true. <laughs> but they used, to, they used to go to the track on a Friday and they're exhausted when they got home on a Friday night. Then they had to be up early on a Saturday to go racing and then they would get home late on a Saturday night. So um, I think that was a sacrifice they made. They actually never used to really go out with friends and... Um, other than their race friends. Other than their race friends. So they, they never were at clubs or things like that. Um, they seem to just be racing most of the time. So, but Jordan thinks that we stopped him going. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes a lot down to muscle memory when you when you're a child and when you're growing up. But I mean, I don't ever recall going to the gym or being forced to go to the gym. I think we were naturally active. I don't think we 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 hardly ever stayed inside and watched TV. If we were at home, we were playing cricket in the backyard or playing soccer or whatever it was, and majority of most weekends, we were at the racetrack. It's not because we were forced to be at the racetrack, but it's what we wanted to do. So both our parents supported us. And I mean, my dad must have driven around the countryside a million times in order to take us to all the races that we wanted to go to. I mean, we would travel to Petersburg on a Friday, go practice, race on a Saturday, and we'd be in the car and we'd drive all the way to Durban so that we could make the regional race in Durban on the Sunday. So I think... It takes a lot of time and effort, but it takes a lot of time and effort from your parents. I mean, they're consistently putting in the time, the money, and, you know, traveling to all these different places to support something that you want to do. And as long as you want to do it, um, they never ever backed. So they never ever told us, no, we can't go there, or no, we can't go to Cape Town to test, or no, we can't do this. I mean, they never ever, they never stopped us from doing any of that. And I think because we wanted to do it and because we put in the effort to do it, it wasn't a sacrifice from their side, you know, it was them supporting us and putting in the time and effort. And that's how we got to where we did is not only because we put in the time on the track, but my parents both put in the time, you know, behind the scenes and 
we were there doing the laps. And yes, we weren't practicing on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, we still had to do school, even though we didn't want to do school. <laughs> we still participated in all the school sports and we were still actively involved in our school side. But racing was our, obviously our number one priority. And so pretty much every, every weekend is we spent at the racetrack putting in time and, um, you know, laps in order to get to where we, where we were. And just uh, sort of following up on those points, and I'm going to throw it to sort of both of you, um, Tasman and Jordan. Tasman, from a physical perspective, they say that motor, uh, motorists are amongst the fittest sports people in the world. What is it that you guys do to keep fit? How do you keep fit physically? And then Jordan, um, from following on what your mom says, how do you keep fit mentally? And did you guys not miss out on the parties and the clubs and stuff, do you see that as not missing out or was it just not something that was just sort of an, of interest? Um, yeah, especially, I think if you look at mine and Taz's sort of fitness, it's two different elements. Like her races are, her cars that she's driving first of all are slightly more physical, but her races are shorter distance. So she's doing a lot more strength, explosive workouts sort of stuff. And where I, my fitness is really kind of a bit different because we stuck in the car. We could be like in all the stuff I do is endurance racing and you could be stuck in the car between one and three hours inside the car. Like some races in Japan, I recall it was 68 degrees inside the car. You're wearing a three layer fireproof suit, helmet, everything. You've got no air con, anything like that. So if you can imagine you're stuck there for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, there has to be some sort of fitness. So when I'm, depends on the event I'm going to as to how I structure my training, um, especially leading up to the big events. I do a lot of long cardio cycles, keep the heart rate which in, within the range where I am two, three, four hours at a time. Um, a lot of, I spend a lot of time in saunas actually, just purely getting my body used to the heat. So I exhaust myself in the gym and then spend the time in the sauna. That's something that I've actually found has helped, which is good. And then what's important is dietary requirements. And I think that leads to the mental side of things. It's when you're eating a lot of sugary, like really bad stuff is when I feel your, your brain power doesn't develop. And like you mentioned, it's the mental side is what's super important for me because the focus point of it, you, norm, normally all of us are car fit and you physically possible to do it because of the training side of it but mentally if you're not focusing and building on that and really working on it and, and diet is super important with it if you make one mistake at the end of your three hour stint everything you've done before is a waste of time you know and i'm getting paid quite decently to perform at a high level for representing a brand so they expect like they expect anyone going to work they expect 100 percent all the time from the moment you step into the office the moment you get out my office looks a bit differently and it goes around in circles at high speeds but it's the same sort of thing you know so and the weekends how, Jordan, itself yeah how do you prepare but, yourself mentally so I, I mean i think that's quite an important point um you know I've, my folks live in cape town and i often drive to cape town to go visit them and we'll do it in one day and by the end of the 12 hour drive you mentally stuck you bug it yeah. I'm not racing anyone. I'm not going around a track. I'm not, you know, doing what you do. How do you prepare yourself mentally? I, I wouldn't, I don't have any mental coaches. I don't have any of that. I, I did participate or I was lucky enough to be selected back in 2014. I was part of a, one of 10 drivers from around the world in the FIA Young like Driver Excellence Academy. And we learned a lot about mental, like, how mental power works and when to use your your mental capacity and a lot of it comes down to the way i structure my weekends i really have to switch on switch off switch on switch off because if you're constantly switched on and you're never resting and you really got to take your rest correctly and like i said what's what's important for me is just a simple thing like missing the wrong meal or getting a PR event like put in place when instead of me spending 10, 15 minutes, always before I get in the car, I spend 10, 15 minutes warming up or 
just keeping quiet, keeping to myself, listening to music, all those things play important in like have important factors and it's what works for you. And I've learned over time, over these events, what works for me. And for example, having my dad or my mom or something at the events is actually really good mentally for me because when I'm stressed and stuff, I can just speak to them. They, they take me away from the actual point that's stressing me, calm me down. And then I'm able to go out and deliver or simple pick up the phone, call if they're not there, for example. So yeah, it's not like I, study certain things mentally it's not like i do any of that it's just that i clearly have the structure that works for me make sure i follow my structure and it's kind of a laid back structure it's not like everything timed out but i know i need to make sure i eat well before i get in the car with the, within the hour before hydrate myself which is super important mentally get myself to a quiet space before just to calm down warm up, make sure I go through the same procedures, everything. And then I just get my helmet on quite early before I get in the car. Cause that way I can just, I'm in the zone. I can shut my eyes. I can think what I need to do because as soon as you jump in, you've got to be performing at a high level from the moment you get into the moment you get out. And most times you can ask my dad, sometimes I jump out of a car and I'm absolutely exhausted, but then I just go through my steps again and I get back in two hours later and it looks like I've never done, I haven't done anything. So it's just about making sure you're always focusing on ticking everything, you know, because if you miss one meal, if you miss one drink, it's not what it does to you at that moment. It's how it leads on down the line, especially in these races. And at the end, when you need to perform, I think, and you don't have the power, that's when it also goes. And something that within me, I don't know what it is, but no matter how tired I am, no matter how, exhausted i am i'm able to drag myself to the top with with adrenaline and use everything i can right to the end and the moment i don't have to focus anymore my body shuts down and i'm completely destroyed Gordon, just i wanted to ask at what uh, two questions at what stage did you uh did you start realizing that you had to set up certain let's say procedures or things that you had to do both nutritionally and structurally for your racing um, and then also like who was one of your biggest influences in terms of that? Like, um, I know you said you didn't have a specific mental skills coach or anything like that, Yeah. but there must have been people that played a role in you developing or in you deciding that you needed that. Yeah. So growing up through my career, when I went overseas for the first time in cars, obviously it was just me and my dad, uh, we were entered in a one mate championship, with, um, by VW and that was going really successful. And the first year was actually a bit of a struggle. And maybe if I had someone guiding me along there, because I was still a kid relying on natural fitness, all that sort of thing. But we were just missing something. And yeah, it could have been anything, you know, from the technical side of it to just learning the tracks. And I just, my approach in that aspect wasn't as spot on. And one of my rivals is a close friend of mine now, and I actually live with him, uh, Calvin Finland, another South African, who you guys would know about. And he was kind of, in that sense, probably a little bit better mentally prepared. And I know at that time he, he like had like some mental guys that he was speaking with. And I think that's when he got into the Young Driver Academy that I was in the year later. And, and that was definitely the point where I turned around. And when I was in that academy, we had... Um, fitness coaches from Edinburgh University, their mental coaches and stuff. And we really dug deep into the way our body works. And it's really quite cool. I think Taz has also done this course recently. And it's the way my body works and the way my mind works. And I started to learn, that's when I learned about it. And then from there, because I have all that and I'm able to speak to a lot more people and because I, my career kind of escalated into the professional scene, I was able to be in touch with a lot more people in that aspect. And that's, it's more just by learning and practice and referencing to a lot of, a lot of guys. And I don't underestimate the power of having someone with the professional background to sports psychology, to a degree in coaching, like specializing in professional athletes and stuff like that, what you do and stuff like that. I think, I didn't believe in it initially because I was kind of just relying on raw talent and ability and just going along with it. But now that I know more what it takes, I'm not saying I'm the perfect athlete by no means. I'm probably a bit overweight and a bit 
<laughs> a bit unfit, but when it comes down to being ready for a race, I make sure my body is at 110% ready. And through that weekend, I do everything that I have to do to perform at 100% on my abilities. I don't slip up and do something that I shouldn't do because that's just wasting ability and talent. Mm. And then Tasman, also, um, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, man. To, coming to psychological sort of elements, being a, a girl in a male dominated sport, do you find that the guys try to psych you out and do you therefore need to be psychologically stronger than they are? Yeah, I think coming like as a female, you obviously think a lot more about certain things. And sometimes that is, that's affected me a lot. It's affected me on track where it shouldn't. Um, so I, I've had to learn over the years of racing when to allow things to get to me and when not to. And um, I think the guys do try their best to, to try and get under your skin. I mean, I've been laughed at a few times walking onto the grid because I've got a ponytail sticking out my helmet. And um, I think once you show what you're capable of doing on track, they sort of get off the track and their mouths are shut because they know, okay, no, this is actually someone we need to take seriously this weekend, you know? So I think it, it was taking what they said and taking how they reacted to me being there to pushing me to a certain point where I was able to perform that little bit better on track to show my capabilities and to show them that I was there to take it seriously and that I was a competitor just like everyone else. So I would say it actually pushed me in the right direction and it made me a stronger racing driver for it. So I don't think it was a negative thing at all. Um, if anything, they actually, they helped me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, don't, I, I think initially you start thinking about it too much and you take it too seriously and you take it to heart. But once you learn how to deal with it and to put it into the right categories and to help push you in a certain way, I think um, it, it turns you into a better racing driver then or a better competitor. And uh, Ian, moving on to financial requirements, motorsport is not a cheap sport to get into. You've obviously put two kids through um, the sport. I don't want sort of uh, facts and figures, but maybe you can give our listeners just some insight into exactly how much it does i mean it is an expensive sport to to manage look we we've been fortunate enough through my early career in motocross and then going into the the, the car series and that after my broken back and stuff i had a good name when i left motocross which helped me secure sponsors going into circuit racing so all my sponsorships that we've had along the years have always been put together as more eventually as a friendship than just trying to take 10 bucks from somebody so you can buy another tire. So we built on long-term relationships with sponsors. I've had sponsors, it's not many big sponsors, probably three or four in my career and the kids that, um, that have stuck with us um, because we give back. So for every, every 10 bucks they give you, I had to give him back a hundred, a hundred, a hundred rands worth of um, exposure. That's how I did my business structure with a sponsorship. So, yes, we had Stuart and Lloyd's in the early days. Then I had a company, Jenny Air Conditioning, when we went saloon car racing, and then it went to PG Glass, who were with us for nearly 10, 12 years, and they followed us on. And when I stopped, they didn't stop sponsoring. They carried on with the kids because we gave them. And we were like a family. They used to come to the races. They used to market. They used to help us. We used to go and help them at events and stuff. And then obviously when Geordie went overseas, um, we still had PG Glass on a little bit in the karting days and his first year. And a good friend of ours through the racing, through the karting, Gavin Varigis. Um, Gavin, for whatever reason, took a liking to Jordan. I don't know why, but uh, Geordie seemed to tick the right boxes with Gav. And... Um, yeah, Gavin, Gavin was a big help when we went international with Jordan. He, he put a lot of backing into Jordan uh, privately. And um, yeah, we can't thank him enough. And it helped bridge that little bit of a gap where we were struggling a little bit with funds to get there. But yes, it can be done. Um, we're not multi-zillion millionaires or whatever. We built a business over the past 27 years. Uh, which is sort of doing okay and keeping us alive. And um, we've been able to go racing, but we've been fortunate enough to have sponsors. 
and we look after the sponsorships and uh, I don't want them for a year, we want them for five, six, ten years. So you don't go and kill them the first year, you give them what they need and you progress that way. A lot of people sit back and say, yeah, but we don't have the money and you eat rum steak every night when we're having mints and whatever the case, it's not the case. Um, yeah, we go racing, we made a lot of sacrifices, a lot of things we didn't do so that we could go racing and um, it's paid off at the end of the day. But both Cheryl and myself have put it into the fact that if the kids give 100%, we will give 100%. If they're only going to give 50% on a day, we only put 50% into it. And it has been a big family sport, even with Morgan, our middle daughter. She probably knows more about motorsport than any of the other four of us do, about what happens around the world in all forms of motorsport. And um, she's a provincial indoor netball player. And she loves motorsport, but she, she tried it twice. I think Tasman stopped it by taking her out in a cart once or twice too many. I always she... get blamed for this. It was my fault. So yeah, Morgan didn't go racing. And um, the, the other two in the family, we did it every weekend together. And we still try and do it as a family at every event. We, one of the family members from here will be supporting Jordan or Tasman at every event that they can get to overseas. So uh -huh. you sit back and say, and a lot of guys sit back and their families sit back, oh, we got the talent, we got this, but nobody paid for us to go overseas. Um, you've got to grin and bear it. It's, there's sacrifices to be made. And you can go there. The Binders have done it. In the old days, back in the days, um, the Albertains, I mean, Greg Albertain, I think, went overseas when he was 15 or 16 to tackle the World Motocross Championship. And he lived in a little room at the back of some oak's house in Holland. He wasn't liked very much because he was very quick. Um, Grant Langston did it the same way. Um, the guys have been over there. The Binder boys have been there. Their dad and mom have put the effort into it as well. But for every cent they put in, the kids have put in another cent of effort and time and commitment. So the Funnelinders, the Aberdeens, yes, there's lots of them out there that have done it. But there's multitudes of them sitting there saying, it. nobody gave us a break. You've got to make the break happen and you've got to find a way to get there. And if you've got to sacrifice certain things, well, that's what you've got to do until it happens. And um, just closing before we, we go to questions from the guys online um, and to Jordan and Tasman, your dad mentioned sponsors. And obviously there's a lot of requirements on you guys from an appearance perspective to keep sponsors happy. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of times where you're tired and you cut fall and you just really couldn't give a hoot and, but you still have to go do it. Um, do you realize the importance of that? And is it something that youngsters growing up need to realize the importance of sponsors and, and the role you are playing for them as they are playing for you? Yeah, well, I mean, you've had to, we've had to obviously learn to talk in front of a camera and to, to be that spokesperson for that sponsor. Um, they are the ones backing you and they're the ones for you. Well, they're the reason you're there at the track and you're able to race and to perform. Um, so you kind of got to give back. And if you don't have that ability, they are obviously going to turn around and say, well, you know what? They're not doing a good enough job. I'm going to like, maybe look at someone else. So it's initially it's something that I don't enjoy doing. I don't like being on camera. I don't, I don't like if, if there's an interview that's displayed, I don't watch myself on TV. Um, but it's something we've had to learn to do in order to keep the sponsorships on board. So not only is it just TV coverage, um, it's also going to events and being a spokesperson for, for a certain brand or whatever it may be, you know, you've got to keep the sponsors happy um, so that you're able to keep yourself happy at the racetrack and to be able to perform and to be able to be there. So if you don't have that, they never, they're not going to back you for long. So they'll be on board for a little bit until they realize that they, they're not getting what they want from you and they're going to step away and find someone that they can do. Jordan is obviously, he's, he's a little bit more, yeah. been a little bit higher in the spotlight than I have for the last couple of years. And um, so he's had to learn to do it a little bit quicker than I had to. Um, so maybe he has a little bit more to say about it. I think... I think one thing to know about sponsors, especially when it gets to the level where I am with corporate like companies, like massive, I'm obviously driving for manufacturing. We got some big deals that go ahead and certain things that happen. And I think you've got to treat 
the smallest guy who is giving you the smallest amount of money out of his own passion, like out of his own pocket because he's passionate to have a tiny logo maybe on the side of your helmet or the massive multi-million euro sponsorship that you were able to secure. I think you have to treat both equally. And I think every person starts off this relationship with a sponsorship. If they're bit committed, they'll start off in a good manner. They'll be enthusiastic. The sponsor's enthusiastic to build up to the season. Everything is good. You go have an awesome shoot. You display your sponsors. You've got your cap, your shirt, your collars nicely ironed. Everything's there. But it's the attitude that you go through after that that I think is important. And I'm kind of learning along the way, and I'm not saying what I've done is right, but the feedback at least that I have, and considering that I still am where I am now uh, with the manufacturer, is when, for example, when I've come off a DNF, like had a DNF at one of the major events in, in our calendar, Spa 24 Hours, and you, the last thing you want to do after a mechanical failure, after something that wasn't your fault or just some event that didn't go the right way, et cetera, et cetera, certain things like that. Or you might have got injured, for example. The last thing you want to do is be positive and represent your sponsor, show, put on a good face. But I can promise you, in those tough times when you are going out there with the same enthusiasm, if not more than you were when you first signed the sponsor, the launch meeting, all that, and you're able to put the same enthusiasm, go out to like, for example, I spent two days at a Bentley family event, which for customers and stuff for Bentley or families or actually people who work at Bentley, walking around, signing things. But from the beginning to the end, I'm not, I didn't really, I wasn't super excited about doing it, but I was super excited about going there and putting on a great face for myself, for Bentley Motorsport, showing what we believe in, what we're thankful for, for Bentley Motors, the company, for example, for putting into the industry, all that. And I think that's important that, like Taz said, you might not like it, but when the camera's on, when you're in front of people, when you're in front of an audience, really, think to yourself why like what makes me love the sport what makes me want it? because without those people you can't do it and if you don't find that inner motivation to do it in the tough times that's when people aren't going to back you because why would they back someone who's not interested why would they back someone who doesn't give it 100 percent? the people who are backing you are people who are passionate about the sport so you've got to show that you're passionate back and it's in the tough times that people lose sponsorship deals that's why i'm referring to it and i think it's in the good times. Everyone in the good times can rant and rave and thank their sponsors. And it's not that hard and you can show a reward because you're on the podium, but it's in, it's in the tough times when people don't give their sponsors what they want. They kind of slag them off. They might find a new sponsor who kind of, then their motivation's there. They forget about the people who back them. And like I said, no matter from the small guy to the big guy, treat them all the same because all of them are playing a part in our reason why you're where you are today. Um, thanks, guys. In my family, mom always ends up with the last word, so I'm going to end up with, with mom. Um, your family is very tight knit. It, it's very united. It's 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 very much together. Do you think that is a major reason in terms of the massive success that your kids have had? Um. Yes, in a way, I do because I think if we all just decided to one this one does that and that one doesn't do, want to do that. I think, I think we've all, we all sort of gelled together and um, I think we've all got interest. Um, I think it would be horrible if one of us hated motorsport because it would be like, um, it wouldn't be so, you know. A but uh, sentence. Yeah. So I think with all, with all of us loving it and, um, and I think, Hey, just watching my two with all the dedication and the sacrifices and everything that they've actually done. I mean, I'm I'm a real proud, like proud mom because uh, I mean I haven't seen my son. He moved overseas when he was 18 years old, and to let your little boy go at 18 is um, quite difficult. Um, so I only see him a, a few times a year. So. Um, when you go on your holidays. 
Yeah, not <laughs> yeah. when she goes for a two week vacation, <laughs> she really hates it that much. <laughs> I think I think also a lot of people don't understand the sacrifice they because it's not necessarily a sacrifice. It's it's about it's about well, the amount works. of time you put in to what something that you really love to do. So it's it's not about not spending time with your friends and our parents saying, no, we can't go out because tomorrow we got to go to the racetrack. That was all our choice. It wasn't because we were told no or because we were told yes or whatever it was. It's, it's, it's going for something that you really want to do and achieving something like a goal of yours is to get to a certain level. And once you reach that goal, it's that goalpost moves. It's never, ever, it never, ever remains the same. So I think, we've learned a lot from each other. I'm now currently learning from my younger brother. <laughs> so, and we've both developed everything and learned from my dad. So my dad's always been there supporting us and shining at us on the side of the, on the side of the track. And it was never always, um, you know, uh, what rainbows and flowers. Okay. It was, it was, it was hard work, but it was something that we wanted to do. So every little bit of criticism we got, we took it on our belt, not always well, because we always did fight back, but we always knew that my dad knew best and knew what was good for us. And so when he told us to do something, it was something we learned and something we tried. And if it worked, it worked. And if it didn't, then we, we tried something else. And I think both my brother and I always took in the information and tried to give the best that we could on track. And like my dad said, when we didn't really feel like being there or we didn't feel like giving 100% or he didn't think like we were giving 100%. He would be like, okay, guys, today are we here to play or are we here to win? So just let me know which one we had to do. And <laughs> I, mean, he's I, know so what, yeah, I know what effort to put in. And that's how it went. You know, it, he, he never held us back from just going to the, the track and having fun. Um, but if we wanted to be there to win, he knew to give 100%. And if we wanted to be there to chill at the back of the field, which was never, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, quite quickly, we, we gave it 100% when he gave us that. So yeah, we knew we were messing around and we knew we had to kick our butts in back into play and get on with it, you know. So it wasn't always easy um, and it was, it was hard along the way, but we learned so much from it and it's made us the racing drivers we are today. Yeah, I think I think just to add to that before we go to questions, because I think it's quite important to say is it's not like I said, it's not sacrifices, but it's always you kind of question yourself. You say, is it worth going to that house party where, you know, you just know how kids are as much as it is. There's going to be alcohol there. There's going to be certain things. You're going to be staying up late. Is it worth doing that or is it worth waking up early the next morning on Saturday going either karting or going cycling training to benefit my racing or is it worth spending time on the simulator still with my friends so I'm still socializing online blah 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 or is it better going yeah to a nightclub and it was always those things and not saying that our way was the best way but when we were already missing so much school we were catching up on a lot of school because education I think is quite important my mom made sure that we <laughs> We, we got a good education and like in my matric year i've like, i missed i think 80 or 90 days of school but uh it was 50 days less than taz so i must have done something right <laughs> yeah, he overachieved actually <laughs> um, but i still was able to get good marks and when you're juggling time it's not about sacrifices it's just about what your priorities are and my priority was racing so Unfortunately, you can't do everything. You can't bake a cake and eat it. You are, you've got to give you got to give way somehow. And I was lucky enough that I had good guiding parents who brought me up in a way that they made it clear. They said, "If you give it a hundred percent, we give it a hundred percent." And to me, it was quite easy. If I thought to myself, "Is this actually giving motorsport a hundred percent?" Sometimes I probably could have gone to certain things that I I just thought to myself, "Hang on, I don't believe." I think I'm doing myself injustice here. So let me rather not do it. I didn't even bother asking my parents and my, my mom on the Monday would find out from one of her friends that their kid was at a party and be like, Oh George, why weren't you invited to that party? And I was like, Oh no, I was, but I just didn't ask you because I thought, <laughs> I thought I wasn't, couldn't go, you know, but it's just, it was the way I believed my sacrifice, what I had to do. And I don't believe it's sacrificing. I just believe it's giving everything you got because we only got one chance 
at making, well, you've got multiple chances, but each time you've got to give it 100%. And I'm sure that's where it all factors into. Well, guys, thank you. I mean, you really are an example of a, a unified family. Um, Jared, I'm going to turn over to you for questions. 100%. Okay, so thanks so much, guys. That was really insightful and I think valuable to a lot of people. Um, so from Michael Ellett, uh, Jordan and Tasman, who are the best SA drivers you've raced against? And I think what would be a good add-on to that would be why would you say that they were the best? Um, yeah. So from my side, there, if you look at raw talent, I think there was a lot of guys in karting that I raced against that were just as just as talented, you know. And um, but one guy I would say who's the best that I've raced against is a guy that I've grown up, and the reasons why. So Calvin van Linder is a guy I've raced against from as time began to time now. And I think the reason why is because I think he's got the same trait I have. He doesn't believe what he's done is good enough, and we're always trying to strive for better. And I believe the best racing driver is not the most talented guy that I've raced against. It's the guy, the all round guy, the guy who also gave up sacrifices, the guy who, yeah, in, in all condition, but still able to have that talent and that ability to excel above the rest. And I think what, what I think talent is also down to a lot of hard work. It's not just about pure ability because if you don't work hard, talent means nothing. Well, yeah, and, um, and then, okay. to be fair, there's, there's also some other guys I've raced against, like older, like older guys who, like multiple South African champions that I've raced against, and I think they they people that I've like learnt off is likes of Lee Thompson, who was one of my driver coaches and probably one of the fastest guys in front wheel drive that I know of, and I think if you look at in that sense, like why they were the best is just, I think it just goes down back to the same thing. Super hard working, always looking to better themselves, learning of others. And if you, as soon as you narrow minded, all the people who I know who are top of the top, as much as they don't show it, when you really watch them, they hundred percent picking up of every other person and every other competitor. And that is what makes you best is if you narrow minded and you think you're the best, you don't stay at the top for long. You know, it's the guys who are learning off everyone and trying new things that are the best. So there, there's a couple guys like that who, who I definitely suggest are really good. Is it my turn? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, I think um, probably one of the first people I would, I would say would be Simon Moss, um, purely because we've raced against each other since we were six years old. Um, and we moved through all the categories together and always competed against one, uh, one another. He also comes from a, a family that was heavily involved in motorsport. Um, Terry, his dad. Simon's a little bit of a nutcase on track, though. So he isn't one of those reserved drivers. Um, he goes all out. And if he wins a race, he wins a race. He's really fast when he puts a lap together. But it, like to put a whole race together is a challenge for him because <laughs> he doesn't know where the limit is. Um, but yeah, he's really competitive. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and then also like so Matthew Hodges, someone else that I competed against um, in the senior categories of karting and, and Polar Cup, Denaro Bonafidi. So, there was a, a few of us that all grew up together and moved through all the, the karting ranks and into national circuit racing together. And I think it comes down to, like Jordan says, it's not just pure talent, it's, it's hard work and who puts in the time in, in, in the car and off track. And um, I think that's the majority of what it actually comes down to and who's been successful and who hasn't been. Hmm. Yeah, and I'd say I've also raced against the guys that Taz mentioned, and yeah, it's exactly the same. They're all super, all of them with, with South African championships behind their name, um, and I think the reasoning is literally down to that, and yeah, su super talented guys, and guys that I was fortunate enough. What was nice is because my dad had a racing team. Um, when I was a kid, I was going to every race I could during school holidays and stuff like that, 
and mechanicking on the likes of Matthew and Gennaro's cars and stuff like that. But at the same time, all I wanted to do was watch and just do what they did and repeat what they did. And when I was on track battling with them, I was kind of the young kid, so they bullied me a bit, but I learned from them and was able to beat them and use that to motivate me to go further as well. I think it's hard to pinpoint certain drivers and who was the best and who wasn't. I mean, there is so many talented racing drivers from South Africa, some who've made it and some who haven't. Um, but it doesn't take away from their world championships that they won, like Wesley Orr and Michael Stevens and, and those guys who've, Gavin Cronier, Mark Cronier, all of those guys who started in karting and progressed into, into main circuit racing. So I think it's hard to pinpoint who the best South African racing drivers are. But I mean, some have, have moved, uh, progressed in their careers and some who were just as successful in South Africa who got paid to race in South Africa. So I don't necessarily think there are certain drivers who are, who are the best and who aren't. Um, it just comes down to who puts in the amount of time and the effort to, to make their career happen. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, with your knowledge of local racing in SA, are there many opportunities to get involved, not necessarily as drivers, but in driver management posis positions, assisting teams and those types of things? This is from Mason Mayer. Uh, look, I've run a, I've been involved a long time with like running my own team and we've nurtured guys coming from karting into circuit racing and that. So yes, there is, there is a market out there for it. Um, you've got to get involved with a team at some stage and work your way through with that team. Um, and then into the management side, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just go racing and find something to do. Um, there's a lot of things that go on and it's a big industry now in South Africa like it is in the rest of the world. Yeah. So you've got the mechanics, you've got the, the truck drivers, you've got the cleaners, you've got the engineers, you've got the managers that run around trying to find all the stuff and a and good I, manager, yes, can work. And I think if you look at it, if you look at any successful guys in careers and you, re, you see some super successful guys in the international scene and you yeah, they had age like around my dad's age, so a bit, a bit older. I'm not going to say grandpa age yet, but they, they, they're quite there. But you can't just step in at management level. Like, what is the point? I don't, I just, as a driver, I didn't just step in in Formula One, you know? You got to go through the development. And, you know, same with me. You got to get your hands, you got to build your way through it. And motorsport is a ladder. You got to, be willing to give it a hundred percent when your first job in the industry is just being the tire guy. And at the same time throughout the career and you build, and if you want to make things happen, you will make things happen. You're going to meet people because motorsport is a big community, it's a, but it's also a family community. And if you give it, you know, you always, there's always people to meet within industries. There's always possibilities and it's always switching around. And I've seen so many people in my short time in Europe, like, guys starting out they were just coming along and now they lead race engineers in i've only been here in europe for that for a short period of time you know so it can happen all over and i think with that i think that it has to go to be said whether it be driving or not driving motorsport offers so many opportunities and there's so many awesome teams and families out there like family teams who if you like that aspect or professional teams that you got to, you can join and I'm sure you're able to work your way up. And it's like anything, it's like any business, anything. If you, you just got to be able to have the passion. And I think a lot of people in the sport want to join it because of passion. So I don't think that's a, a question to, to be said. And then uh, Tasman, did you ever feel out of your depth? And if so, how did you mentally overcome it? So being the pinnacle of, of ladies motorsport in South Africa? Yeah, I mean, the first time that I like, when I applied, I found out via Twitter, well, someone tagged me in Twitter about this um, W series that was coming about. So when I eventually got hold of them and applied for it, I didn't know how many female racing drivers there actually were in the world. <laughs> and so we got an answer back saying that we've reviewed your, um, reviewed your CV and we want you to come to the second round. And we went to Austria and there was over 60 of us there fighting for 28 positions. And um, 
all these goals are sort of, they've been in the same boat that I have been my entire racing career, as you could call it that. And they've only ever competed against guys. So we were all at a very similar level, but also a lot of the girls had obviously raced in formula categories um, in the UK and against the best formula guys um, that were current at that time. And so when I made it into W Series, I did feel a little bit out of, like, out of the scene a little bit because purely for the fact that I've come from a front wheel drive car, not because I haven't raced overseas before. So it was sort of the adjustment that was scary to me. Well, not scary, but made me feel a little bit out of my depth, um, out of my comfort zone. Um, as my dad would say, I, I've always been very much of a, a comfort zone um, racing driver. <laughs> so I think that was the biggest challenge. And once I sort of got comfortable in that and started learning more about the car and the different tracks and getting that little bit faster at every race, um, it sort of came a little bit easier being involved in it all. Um, but it's, it's just about learning and taking in as much information as you can and being able to portray that on the racetrack and, and in yourself as well. So it's almost just knowing that you have the ability and um, knowing that you can push yourself to certain levels, but also still being level-headed about it all and knowing that all these goals have been on the same playing field up until this point and you are competing against the top lady races in the world so to be on that level was something else and yeah I mean I learned a lot from all these other goals even goals younger than I am a couple years younger even and um you never stop learning in motorsports ever ever so I think being able to take that information in and being able to use it and to push yourself a little bit more, it, it just makes it all that much worth it. Okay. I'm just going to add a quick one there is that, do you find that there's a lot of skills that um, transfer from, from one vehicle to, a, to or one type of vehicle to another type of vehicle? And then also if you haven't experienced a particular type of vehicle, what like can you expect a skill transfer um back to the original vehicle if that makes sense yeah well i came so originally i did single seaters so i i raced formula fords and formula volkswagen and then i i jumped over into polar cup which was a front wheel drive and on my second race i actually rolled the car <laughs> because i lifted off she was um, chasing her brother yes i was chasing <laughs> Brother. Well, trying to at least, okay. <laughs> um, I started spinning and instead of getting on the throttle, my brain automatically reminded me of the single seater where you get off the throttle when you're losing the rear and I ended up spinning and rolling the car. So it's sort of training your brain to do the opposite when you're in a different car or with different characteristics. And it's not, you know what you're supposed to do, but when you're in a situation and you're spinning or you you've lost the rear too quickly or you're under steering at a certain point or whatever it may be, it's to tell your brain to do the opposite of what you used to. And I think that's, that's the hardest point about getting to adjusting from one car to another straight away. So once you're used to that car, it, it automatically happens. But when you're transitioning from a front wheel to a rear wheel drive, especially a real wheel drive car that has wings and it's got downforce and you've been driving a front wheel drive um, pogo stick basically is what a polar cup car is um it's 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 hard to transition but once you do get that it's, it's all it's just it's all about training your brain and basically telling yourself the opposite of what you should be doing is what you should be doing yeah and i would i would add to that to say car dynamics on everything is is the same ultimately and the the tire is you treat it in the same way it only offers grip but it's like taz says you need to be able to so the general principle is the same you still got a steering wheel throttle brake but it's just about how you make each tool work for you in that specific car based on what that car needs to be driven and how you extract the performance out the car and it's about doing a bit more your homework into it about developing picking people's brains 
looking at the data, understanding, studying the data, seeing what works really well with the fast driver compared to yourself and making those adaptive changes and how quickly you do it is how successful you are when you're switching and jumping between platforms. And it's something like I've learned over the like last few years to be able to do in a strength, I would say to jump between cars and certain stuff that makes, yeah, that's one of my strengths I would say. And I think it's something that me and Taz are completely different. I'm not afraid to go over the limit where she's slightly more reserved. So she chips away at it. I kind of go explore the limit kind of just miss the wall kind of and then be thankful for that and then know the limit and come back you know so it's it's the way each race and driver works and how they find it but yeah each each, each athlete to their own and as long as you get to the top level at some point i think yeah just the process up to it is is how you do it yourself and how you know your your own way and style of driving and adapting it to what you have to do awesome thanks for that feedback i think we're just going to end off with, with the compliment of the evening. So this is from Jackie Schreiber. So for her personally, it was always inspirational watching you as a dedicated family achieve everything you've achieved. From the day Ian bought Taz's brand new baby car to, to her office, Geordie bailing, bailing you out at the Steg at a corporate karting fundraiser, to working with Geordie at the FIA Driver Academy. It's been a privilege to follow you they're amazing your amazing progress so yeah i think that speaks for itself <laughs> thanks jackie we appreciate all the effort you've put into motorsport over the years um dedicated people like you are hard to come back uh, ian cheryl um tasman jordan thank you so much for joining us this evening on, on uh, your sport it's been an absolute privilege to chat to you and, and get to know you and get to know your sport um, good luck when it, it opens up. Hopefully it will be sooner rather than later. I think, Jordan, you might be out there before or before you, Tasman. Um, yeah. But, yeah, we look forward <laughs> to seeing you guys. Yeah. We look forward to seeing you guys flying. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks Thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. And I think it's quite important to anyone if they want to ask questions, like at least on my social media, I'm always happy to ask and give advice to people because... Yeah, it's, I think I would love to see more South Africans be overseas with me racing and stuff. And I tell every person, whether it's in the sport or not, that chasing your dreams is something you should always do because I, I don't want to get to the point at least where I turn around and look and say, damn, I should have given it 100%. Yeah, very much agreed. Thank you. Thanks for that. Guys, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Be safe. Okay. Eh? Cheers. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye, George. <laughs> <laughs> See you for a while.